Hey guys, Downtown Josh Brown here with another episode of What Are Your Thoughts? Here with Michael Batnick, as always. We're going to cover the biggest topics happening on Wall Street in finance, finance, this week. And I hope you guys play along with us in the comments below. We love your feedback. Let's get right into it. So I wanted to ask you about Uh, whether or not this big stimulus bill that we've all been waiting for all this time has now been fully priced in. I wasn't aware of this. Probably I should have been. The Russell 2000 did 26% in Q4 and caught completely up to the Russell 1000. You must have known that. I just didn't know that. You're stealing my thunder. So why don't we do a mashup? Okay. Your question was my question one. What did you have? So my, my first question, I wanted to talk to you about small cap stocks. So let's just get into that. Small cap stocks pulling forward the, the stimulus. It made a lot of sense in 2020 when the smaller stocks got hit the hardest. So from mega cap to large to mid to small to micro, like that made a lot of sense because the smaller caps are maybe less profitable, have lower margins, might be over levered, have higher borrowing costs and more sensitive to the overall economy. So all of that made a lot of sense. So you saw the S&P had a drawdown of 34%, the Russell 2000 had a drawdown of 41%, and the micro cap index had a drawdown of 44%. That all made a lot of sense, right? And that was the story that we were sticking with. But then to your point, we look back at 2020 and over the last year, and I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, that narrative changed quickly. I don't even know what the narrative na- narrative is now, but yeah. we've got micro cap stocks now doubling the performance of the S&P 500 over the last year, up 32 versus 15. Russell Shut 2000, up, up wait, 26. Seriously? Micro caps double the S&P last year? Over the la- not, not in 2020, I'm saying over the last year. So oh, starting so from today. mid-January so to mid-January. And the Russell 2000 is up, up 27%. So now how do we... What is going on here? And maybe the only explanation is that these are the biggest beneficiaries of the stimulus that we've gotten. But is it the stimulus or or did they just rally on the vaccines? Because this is why I'm asking you this question. This whole thing seemed to have kicked off in September and then really got underway like in November. And that timeline doesn't coincide with the stimulus. It coincides with the phase three trial data and the approvals of the vaccines. And if that's true and these stocks haven't quite priced in all of the stimulus yet, like there could still be a lot of upside for cyclical and and small value and all of I these think, catch-up yeah, trades. I think we got that big pop on the small, on the value. Wasn't that after the election day, which was the same morning that we got the vaccine news? Was that the same day? They That all happened within a week, I think. It was crazy. So it was crazy. Get, the, get this. You look at the top 10 stocks in the Russell 2000. The average stock is up 163% over the last six months. Like from the from the low, from the bottom? No, 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 ju- no, just six months. Okay. So not July? quite the bottom, July. Okay. Um, now, those top 10 only represent 4.5% of the, uh, the index. What are they? Do you know what they are? I do. These are the biggest Russell 2000 stocks. So here we go. Plug Power. Okay. That makes up, sense. This is the biggest, biggest winner, up 600%. Yep. Penn National Gaming, yep. Caesars, Sunrun, Darling Ingredients. I don't know this one. Um, MRTX. You see that symbol all over the place. Natera, NTRA, Decker's Outdoor, IIVI, and another pharmaceutical one. So three of the top ten are, are healthcare. Four of the top ten are consumer discretionary. Right. Yeah. The casino stocks. Um, the Penn Gaming thing has its own story. I don't know what this Marathi Therapeutics is, but it, anyway, it your, looks like it cured cancer. Did this we, is a $200 stock now. Is the stimulus priced in? To me, these are like the obvious, obviously the complete unknowables. What's yeah. priced in? You don't know. You find that after the fact. So we'll see. I guess that's probably the answer that I would settle on, not because it's a cop out, but just because there, there are still new details emerging about how much money Biden really wants to spend this year. Like the numbers continue to be ratcheted up. So how could it be priced in just yet? They're now talking 1.9 trillion and you don't and, need that much to surprise people to the upside. And if we're saying that these companies are the success or failure is more predicated on the vaccine than the stimulus, what happens if, if the vaccine continues to go at a snail's pace or what happens if it ramps up and we get herd immunity quicker than possible? Maybe we could have it see another leg higher. So who knows? 
They could not have done a worse job at the vaccine. Embarrassing. 12 million people so far. They only had a, they only had a fucking year to figure this out. How many people got a vaccine so far? 12 million. Might as well be zero. Could not have done a worse job. Um, all right, so we did a mashup. So th- is that back to me? One, one more detail that I wanted to, to shed light on. Granted, it's January 19th, so we've got like, you know, basically no data. So forgive me for year to date numbers. Let's just do month to date. Okay. The microcap index, which I know people, you know, don't care for, is up 10%. The Russell 2000 is up 8%. The S&P? Already to start the year. The S&P is flat. Yeah, well, so that's like, we're not going to get into this today. By the way, January effect? Yeah. I feel like, why haven't we really been seeing that? We are seeing that. No, 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 I'm saying that in the S&P. No, in the headlines. Because the January effect is, is the propensity for smaller stocks to do better in January. Oh, I think we've been busy with like civil war. So uh, <laughs> that might have crowded certain things out of the headlines, like the January effect, for example. It just seems a little bit less urgent to talk about these days. Uh, um, I want to talk about the Microsoft cruise breaking news, which I was too busy driving my kid to school. I don't even know what's going on. And then you told me what happened. Um, I'm a GM shareholder. Hang on, hang on. Let me that- rewind. But before you get into your story, I just want to say that we probably spoke about GM, I'm guessing in November or so. Yeah. Where you were making the case for it being it having a huge technology arm in the self driving cars that people weren't giving it credit for, and yeah. people I don't know if people were dunking, but because it had a you know pulled back from a high, it went vertical up to forty six, pulled back to forty, whatever, whatever, and now it's at fifty four. So kudos to you. I appreciate that. I'm not uh, bringing this up to take a victory lap. I think it's a massive story, very important for lots of other investments. Um, Duncan was showing me comments. Like it was like, okay, boomer, you mm-hmm. don't understand. GM uses union labor. Um, Tesla's going to Tesla, kill them. Right. Yeah. All right. Good call, guys. The good thing about me is that I'm not so in love with my own opinions that if somebody says a comment to me, I'll actually consider it. The so, good thing about me. <laughs> that's like one good thing about I have I'm like actually, three or you know, four good I'm things. Actually a little, that's I'm one actually of them. A little, I'm a little bit too humble. <laughs> <laughs> no, not humble. I, I'm never so sure of myself that I won't listen to somebody else. That's Let's like one good point. thing about me. One of the reasons why G, uh, Tesla has been able to become one of the most valuable stocks in the world, and we talked about, we touched on this last week. There was this like investment thesis where the higher the stock price goes, the higher it will go, <laughs> because with every new leg higher, they can sell another five billion dollars worth of stock, no problem, no questions asked which gives them a further and further edge because of how much money they're willing and able to spend. GM has had to fund its electric car ambitions out of cash flow. That's a clear advantage that Tesla has had in the eyes of the public. I think with Microsoft's partnership, and I don't know every detail just yet, um, but I think that that narrative changes. Like I don't think GM now is hurting for cash anyway. But I think just this whole idea that they're not a tech company, so they can't ramp up to the extent that Tesla and some of these smaller EV companies can, it's bullshit. Like, throw it out. That's not applicable anymore. If you had to guess, Tesla shares outstanding, what's the growth the growth over the last five years? Take a stab. How many new shares have they issued? What percentage has the total, flow grown? Total shares outstanding. How much has that grown over the past five years? Oh, I would guess by a third. Um, a little bit more than that. 40, what is this number? 43%. Right. So, all right. I mean, it's a, it's a big number either way. It's a little bit more than I would have thought. Um, GM already committed to spending $27 billion over the next four years, which is a big, big dollar amount for a hundred year old quote unquote value stock Dow component, what, you know, however you want to f- form a Dow component. This stock is now at an all time high since it came back public after the bankruptcy in 2011. I don't see any resistance here. I'm not a seller. Microsoft and other investors put in $2 billion at a $30 billion valuation. That's obviously real money. GM's market cap is $77 billion. I think if there's like financial success here, Microsoft could double or triple that amount with its eyes closed. They have almost as much cash sitting around doing nothing as Apple. So this could just be the start. That's that's one. Two, well, at, all right. So Microsoft is going to employ the, the Azure cloud um, to support this venture. And so they'll get paid back. GM's going to spend a lot of money with Microsoft as this as this thing builds out. What's also interesting, though, is that there are things that you can't use the cloud for uh, completely when it comes to autonomous driving, and you need a chip on board, which is what NVIDIA is doing, by the way. Um, 
Because think about this, Mike, you're in an auto, you're in the backseat of an autonomous car. You look out the windshield, you see it's about to hit somebody. The cloud can't communicate quickly enough with the vehicle to stop that, which is why you need the types of uh, microchips on board that NVIDIA is making um, because the car has to be somewhat controlled by itself, not by a server somewhere in the sky. There's got to be a little bit more localized. So anyway, I, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I'm very excited about this. I do think Cruise is going to be one of the most important um, technology ventures going forward. And if you're a GM shareholder, you're not. I don't even think you're even close to getting the benefit of what that could look like. What, one last um, point I want to make real quick is that yeah. Chris, Chris Dixon from A16Z was uh, on a podcast with Ted Seides last week. And when I saw this headline, I thought of what he said, that the improvement that we've seen in the mobile phone over the last decade is just like, you know, absurd. Yeah. And we haven't really seen that in other areas. Um, other, I don't want to say appliances, but just other products. And uh, so maybe, maybe this is the beginning of the electric autonomous uh, driverless uh, you, car, car space you know, really heating up. You know, this guy, Wes Edens. No. He was one of the founders of Fortress, the big hedge fund, and he's now doing his own thing. Uh, he's a part owner of the Milwaukee Bucks. He's like one of those hedge fund managers that bought the Bucks. Wes Edens is the guy building these like maglev trains between Orlando and Miami and all, all of these like uh, – I think they're doing them in California too. This is an example of like things haven't really improved at all. Like the train service or, or the way you get from one city to another – is pretty much the same for the last 50 years versus the phone, which has been completely revolutionized. So I agree with you that that's relevant, I think, both in terms of autos and autonomous driving and in terms of like mass, mass transit and commuting. I really think that in our lifetimes, there's about to be a very profound change there. Um, where are we going next? What do you got? The Wall Street Journal did an article about like how much that is too much. And and uh, I saw John Hilsenrath wrote this. I feel like I haven't seen him in a while. Yeah. Who else? Who better? He's All the right, yelling so, whisperer. So some numbers. Uh, in the past four years, U.S. government debt held by the public has increased by $7 trillion to $21.6 trillion. Uh, Biden's proposed $1.9 trillion aid package includes you know, $1,400 stimulus payments to, to individuals. So they were talking about how much is too much. Where's the line? And there is fierce debate over this. Obviously, nobody knows where the line is, and it's probably a line that we don't want to get too close to because yeah. the ramifications for going over it are substantial. Obviously, the ramifications for doing too little, in my opinion, at this point in time, are you know overweigh those concerns. But I understand those concerns are legit. One thing that people talk about is debt as a share of GDP, which you know we're we're breaking it back above the hundred percent level. Last time we were there was World War II, but the, to me, the the number that really matters is how much it costs to service those interest payments. And one of the concerns that people are talking about is what if rates rise? You know, we're just going to be drowning. We're not going to be able to keep up. But if you look at federal interest as a share of GDP, it's tiny. I mean, we're basically we're ba we're basically borrowing for free. It fell it fell last year. So is now not the time to ramp up. If not now, when? Wait, and we is, are so where is this stat where the interest expense in total actually fell last year? Oh, uh, here. Despite a four trillion dollar increase in debt Last year, uh, which is 25% increase, interest payments on that debt declined by 8%. So, so it happens when rates uh, fall as much as they did. So, right. So, so the point is it's still manageable in terms of like the debt service load. And it's not ideal. I guess the question is how much is too much debt uh, and whether or not we should be back at World War II levels of debt, debt to G GDP. I think the answer to that question depends on whether or not you think we're fighting a war. Um, I personally think that we're fighting a war right now. It's not on a battlefield. It's on an invisible battlefield, but it's an economic war. Many wars, by the way, are economic wars. This is not a war against another country. It's a war against literally like an alien species that's invading our population and you know, killing us You know, one of the off. differences, though, is that we have not mobilized the way that we normally no. do during a war. No, so we have Se no leadership. I think Seattle's uh, mayor is basically turning to Starbucks to help – like with the vaccines roll out because it's just, it's just not happening. I said Amazon Prime should be shipping vi <laughs> frozen vials. I don't know what else to do. We have not mobilized. We have no leadership. We have 50 governors choosing their own adventure. Our governor tried to get a little too cute. He wanted to do vaccines in this very specific way um, by vocation. And I understand why. It's just that we weren't organized to do it. 
So you want to give it to like um, people that drive trucks and they don't have lists of who these people are. They don't know how to alert them that it's available. And then they want to give it in these small settings. So I think we're in a war. I agree with you. We haven't mobilized as though we are. Um, but if this is truly World War V, then those spending levels seem appropriate. And if the battlefield is in the economy to keep people from starving, I think we really have no choice. Now, the real debate is how we use the money and for how long and when do we declare victory and stop spending this way. That's obviously going to be much harder and every bit is political. But I, my, my opinion is it's appropriate. We're able to do it. Um, if debt service costs were twice as high or three times as high, yeah, it would be a big, a, a different story, but they aren't. For better or for worse, they yeah, aren't. I, I want to talk about the Barron's Roundtable, and I had to force you to read this at gunpoint, but I thought, <laughs> it was, I thought it was one of the best ones they've had. It looks like they've shaken things up. They have some really interesting people in here. I was hoping to see a little bit bigger surprises, like maybe throw in Dave Portnoy or something. They didn't quite go that far. But they pulled out all the Bond guys. Like, no Bill Gross, no Gunlock, Gun no Felix Zuloff. All the perma bears seem to be, like, not part of this anymore. They're talking about macro, but they're focused on it being more useful um, to investors, which I like. And then uh, there's some crazy quotes in here. I want to start with this one. They have a guy predicting a low-level civil war, which seems like it, it should be a little bit more alarming. And I'm not quite sure what low-level means. How do you respond to that as an investor when, when you hear somebody's take that that's what's about to happen? You don't respond. As you, a, just, as a, you hope it's wrong? As a person, you, you, know, you get very nervous. But as, a, as an investor, what's, that guy, James Anderson, had a great line. So they were asking about predictions for the market in 2021, as they always do. And he said, it is a random walk and I haven't a clue. Yeah, it's the best. that's the best prediction. So James Anderson is the guy that runs Scottish Mortgage which is the flagship fund that Bailey Gifford, Bailey Gifford ha had a massive Tesla ownership. I think the, the fund doubled uh, last year, one of the best performing large pools of assets. And uh, these guys are, are riding that wave. Uh, Scott Black, <laughs> it's funny, the one-two punch, Scott Black and Mario Gabelli back uh, to Gabelli, back. Gabelli had some gems in there. I feel like he was just jumping off the top rope, right? Yeah, oh, he, he's one of my favorites. <laughs> Um, Scott Black, using the S&P as a proxy, stocks could rise 8 to 10%. Dividends will add another 1% to 2%. There's a lot of liquidity. There are no good alternatives to stocks. Corporate earnings are likely to rise 37% this year. Gabelli's like, the market will hit a big air pocket when we have to deal with Iran and North Korea. <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's the one that I pulled out. I read that. I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so the, to me, these, these are the key themes. Biden's tax plan, the, the, yeah. the vaccine potential inflation, the workplace and income inequality. Those were like okay. the big, the big themes. And one, my favorite line was from William Priest. He wrote, um, stocks could rise six to 8%, but the better yeah. question is the range around that outcome. History suggests plus or minus 35 percentage points. That tells you how diverse the possibilities are. I'll go with six to 8%, but that's a low confidence number. So he's saying the same thing that everyone always says, six to 8%, which is in line with historic average returns. Never has. But but then he's throwing that range of potential outcomes out there, which at least it's it's honest. This one this one's pretty good. Abby Joseph Cohen manages to uh, continue her streak of not really saying anything, but saying but doing that very articulately. Abby Abby Joseph Cohen from uh, Goldman Sachs. She's been doing this since I've been born. I think Goldman Sachs is forecasting the S and P five hundred will rise in the high single digits in the coming months. Okay, so same thing, six to eight percent. <laughs> But with notable volatility, also same thing. Tell people volatility is coming. They won't everyone be surprised by that. it. Everyone says it every year. Stocks will rise, but every year. Volatility. Wait, let me finish. In 2020, volatility levels were almost as high as during the 08 financial crisis. Our team sees the index reaching 4,100 to 4,300 in the second half of 2021, based on expectations of a more stable economy in 22. Most valuation measures are stretched and may not offer support in the face of unpleasant surprises. I want you to pause and just consider every cliche on earth that she managed to get into that one paragraph. Unpleasant surprises are possible. Thanks. I think we were reminded of that this year. Valuation is stretched. Thanks. That's something that people have been saying for at least 11 years. Expect more volatility. Great. That's a tough call. 
More stable economy in 2022. All right, next year will be better all right, than this all right. year. It's already dead. We get it. And second, and second half expectations. Uh, second half recovery. So it's either way, though, I still wanted you to read it. Are you mad um, at me for having to read it? No, I'm not mad at you. Uh, it's interesting that we continue to see people talk about valuations on a 12-month outlook as if we haven't learned anything over the last decade. I think what they're saying is that risk is elevated because valuations are stretched, not that valuations can't get more stretched. All right, fair, but still. Yeah, well, what we've learned recently is that it's the opposite. The higher the valuation, the better the forward performance of the stock. So maybe they should say, thank God uh, valuations are stretched. It's a great environment for the next 12 months. Um, what, what else do you have? Agricultural commodities are going bonkers. Um, sharing a chart of of wheat, of soybeans, and corn. of corn. Is this a harbinger of uh, inflation to come? I'm not a commodity expert. I read Peter Bookvar on this stuff, and one of the things he's pointed out is that it's really primarily at this point still a supply shock. Like they didn't during. During Corona, they weren't able to plant as many acres or whatever. Like you still have issues with harvesting. So what does that mean? Who, who cares where? So it's not. Who cares where it comes from? I'll tell you what it means. <laughs> you would rather have inflation from a supply shock that's fixable, meaning supply will come back online. It's not that a demand shock is automatically bad, but it's scarier if you're an inflation hawk because it means that people are just becoming accustomed to paying up and up and up and up. So. I don't think that you could make the case that, that, that that's quite happening, um, where demand is pushing agricultural commodities higher. It could turn into that. But uh, the people that I read are just saying it's, it's an abnormal environment, so nobody should be surprised by supply shock. We have the same thing with cars. There was a point in August where you couldn't get a car. That has been alleviated. True. Supply comes back online. So I still think that that's what's happening here. Let's bring in Duncan for viewer topics. What do we have this week, Duncan? Hey, hey guys. Uh, so for you, Josh, Adam you got a writes, new baseball hat, I think. No, what no, right? I, I've, I've had this one. This is my what Haas is that, F1. What is that a logo for, Hot Pockets? No, 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 Haas F1, F1 Racing. Oh. <laughs> you yeah. might as well, you, you They're might as well based have been out of North Carolina, Martian. but you know. Okay. But yeah. Uh, so right. anyway, so the question for you is from uh, from Adam, and, and he writes, over the past few years, I have consistently resisted the urge to YOLO my life savings into things like Bitcoin and Tesla. Sometimes that instinct has served you me well. up, I Adam. Quit. That would have worked out perfectly. <laughs> so he says, sometimes that instinct has served me well, like with Nicola, but other times I feel like I've missed out on a moonshot. Is regret at having missed out normal in periods of exuberance like this? Um, and then he goes on to say, my time weighted return last year was 22%. And I feel like teenagers buying out of the money calls and altcoins smoked me. Such a great topic. I'll just say two things. The teenagers are going to get their comeuppance eventually. Um, it may take the form of a very boring market uh, where they churn themselves to death, or it may be a crash, or it might be both. Uh, but it always happens every time. So the the gains that they have are not permanent gains if they if they continue to play the way they've been playing you have to believe me when i tell you that it's never been different um but the second thing that i think is more important is you can live a little you can you can take a little bit more risk yourself um there's a portfolio management concept called core and explore there's nothing wrong with that if 90% of your portfolio is in core asset allocation and then you want to take 10% and do some wild shit. Oh, I'm not going to tell anybody. Michael, are you going to tell anybody? Nope. Nope. Your secret is safe. So don't feel like you have to conform to somebody else's puritanical um, opinion of how to invest. You do what makes you happy and what you think is best for you. I can't promise you you'll love the results, but you might. So Corn Explorer, that's my advice. I actually, I actually got a question like this. I wrote about, I wrote a post in 2017 called "My Friend Is Beating Me," and it was basically the same question. I my friend's that. buying Facebook, Netflix, and I used this Mark Twain line, which is one of my favorite uh, things that he said. It is strange the way the ignorant and inexperienced so often and so undeservedly succeed when the informed and the experienced fail, and that's life. Sometimes you see people that you think are dumber than you making more money, and it's it just deal with it. You could also throw in that quote. I don't know whose it is. Like, there's nothing so infuriating as seeing your neighbor get rich. I think that was Munger or Warren Buffett. Ninety nine. It's like right, right, right in the same wheelhouse. Yeah. All right. All right what Doug, else what we do got? You got? 
Okay, so for you, Michael, Ed writes, what's the best strategy to increase a fixed income position in a portfolio that is significantly overweight equities, specifically for older investors? Given the likelihood that interest rates will rise significantly over the next decade, how can I minimize the risk of principal erosion when accumulating fixed income investments in a zero rate environment? Well, the first thing I would say is I don't know who's expecting interest rates to rise significantly. Nobody that I've read has, is predicting that. But let's just say that interest rates do rise significantly. From 1941 to 1980, the 10 year went from about 2% all the way up to about 20%. And the worst annual decline for a 10 year treasury over that time was 5%. No way. 5%. So you lost money in 10 years, 5%. So are you reinvesting every year as it goes higher? You if you're a fixed income that? if you're a fixed income investor, you want rates to rise. The only way that you're going to get income if, is if rates do rise. So I wouldn't be necessarily worried about that, but if you do want higher rates today, you are going to take a lot more risk. If you want preferred stocks as an example where you could get 4 or 5%, they fell 40% or more in the first quarter of 2020. So it's that simple. More risk, more reward. Um, but I would not be worried about your principal. Yeah, I think you could have short, sharp moments where the bond market hurts you. But it's very hard to imagine like a one-year period where bonds do anything to the degree in terms of damage that stocks could do. In, Only in if you're in zero, zero coupons or long-dated bonds. But other than or, that- or, Right, 30-year treasury, something like that. But that's not what how most people are investing in fixed income. Okay, um, that's all we have for, for this week. Uh, we want to thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure to leave us your comments and suggestions uh, for topics. You can always hit us at askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, I don't really understand what you're waiting for. Go ahead and do that right now. Share us with your friends. Hit that like button. We love when you do that. feels really good. Uh, Mike, anything else we want to wrap up with this week? We're coming back for Wealth Base on Friday, right? Yep. Okay. So tune in Friday. We're going to come back in with uh, the trading competition, Beat the Compound. Um, having a lot of fun there. And we will talk to you all very soon.